Galileo, the church, and Andrew Dixon White. Copernicus made the proposal that the Earth turned on its axis and moved around the sun, which was fixed in space, as were the stars. Now, that wasn't actually a, a totally novel idea. The Pythagoreans had come up with a very similar idea in ancient Greece. Galileo uh, supported Copernicus's theory. Um, exactly when that support uh, began is uh, controversial at this point. Um, but certainly by 1909 when he started making observations in the heavens that supported it, um, telescopic observations of Jupiter's moons and then later mountains on our moon and the phases of Venus and sunspots. The sun actually had imperfections, if you want to call them that, and uh, turned on its axis. And uh, at that point, uh, uh, Galileo uh, started arguing that Copernicus's theory wasn't just a nice theory, it actually turned in to the truth. And uh, regarding Venus, it was interesting, uh, I'm quoting from Andrew Dixon White, uh, uh, herein was fulfilled one of the most touching of prophecies. Years before, the opponents of Copernicus had said to him, if your doctrines were true, Venus would show phases like the moon. Copernicus answered, you are right, I know not what to say, but God is good and will in time find an answer to this objection. The God-given answer came when in 1611 the rude telescope of Galileo showed the phases of Venus. And uh, part of his reference 54 is uh, for Copernicus's prophecy, see Cantu, and Cantu was a, an eminent Roman Catholic. Um, Galileo had taken the Copernican theory out of the realm of hypothesis and argued for its truth. Now, scripture as commonly interpreted was against the hypothesis. And I think we need to come back and revisit that uh, at a later date. Galileo, of course, argued that scripture was not definitive here. It wasn't intended to teach that. It argued it was only speaking about appearances. The, uh, the church, which felt threatened in a number of other ways, uh, this was while the Reformation was still raging, um, they felt threatened by Galileo's arguments. Uh, if they acceded to them, they would look like uh, wimps, uh, pansies, and instead of defenders of the faith, which is what they wanted to appear like. Uh, Pope Urban the Eighth who was once Galileo's friend, felt insulted by the way Galileo argued. He gave the Pope's argument in the mouth of Simplicio, who was a, an ancient philosopher, but of course the word meant s somewhat like it sounds in English, simpleton. And uh, this is not the way to impress people whom you uh, wish to uh, have on your side um, because of various factors, most of them I think arguably sociological but some of them theological, Galileo was made to recant his beliefs uh, and the church in fact put itself on record as being against the movement of the earth. Um, and Andrew Dixon White in the history of the warfare of science with theology and Christendom. And if those of you who want to find it, there are several sites on which it has been transcribed. Um, I have put one of them down, but Gutenberg Books has one, and um, there's at least one more that I have uh, used at times. Uh, he, he said, I shall present this warfare at some length because, so far as I can find, no careful summary of it has been given in our language. Since the whole history was placed in a new light by revelations of the trial documents in the Vatican Library, honestly published for the first time by Les Benoit in 1867, and since 
that by Gebler, Berti, Favaro, and others. What follows now, without quotation marks, uh, are the words of Andrew Dixon White. Now, there, this is not the whole thing. If you want to read the whole thing, you can look on one of the websites or find it in the library. But um, this is kind of the Reader's Digest version uh, clip to make the main points. As to his method, professors bred in the safe science favored by the church argued that the divinely pointed way of finding, arriving at the truth in astronomy was by theological reasoning on texts of scripture. And as to his results, this is of course Galileo, they insisted first that Aristotle knew nothing of these new revelations, why Aristotle needed to know is not clear, and next that the Bible showed by all applicable types that there could be only seven planets. This, this was proved by the seven golden candlesticks of the apocalypse, by the seven branched candlestick of the tabernacle, and by the seven churches of Asia, that from Galileo's doctrine consequences must logically result destructive of, to Christian truth. Bishops and priests therefore warned their flocks and multitudes of the faithful <laughs> besought the Inquisition to deal speedily and sharply with the heretic. In vain did Galileo try to prove the existence of satellites by showing them to, be, to the doubters through his telescope. They either declared it impious to look, or if they did look, denounced the satellites as illusions from the devil. That's a nice way of getting rid of contrary data. It just isn't really there even if I see it. Um, good Father Clavius declared that to see the satellites of Jupiter, men had to make an instrument which would create them. In vain did Galileo try to save the great truths he had discovered by his letters to the Benedictine Castelli and the Grand Duke Christine, in which he argued that literal biblical interpretation should not be applied to science. It was answered that such an argument only made his heresy more detestable, that he was, quote, worse than Luther or Calvin, end quote. The war on the Copernican theory, which up to that time had been carried out quietly, now flamed forth. It was declared that the doctrine was proved false by the standing still of the sun for Joshua, by the declarations that the foundations of the earth are fixed so firm they cannot be moved, and that the sun, quote, runneth about from one end of the heavens to the other, end quote. The war became more and more bitter. The Dominican father, Cassini, preached a sermon from the text, Ye men of Galilee, why, standing, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? And this wretched pun, upon the great astronomer's name, ushered in sharper weapons. For before Caccini ended, he insisted that geometry is of the devil, and that mathematicians should be banished as the authors of all heresies. The church authorities gave Caccini promotion. And um, this is part of the text of what Galileo had to uh, assent to. The first proposition that the sun is the center and does not revolve around about the earth is foolish, absurd, false in theology, and heretical because expressly contrary to holy scriptures. And the second proposition that the earth is not the center but revolves about the sun is absurd, false in philosophy, and from a theological point of view at least opposed to the true faith. Um, skipping down to another part of what he says, about a fortnight later, the congregation of the index, uh, that group that was charged with uh, selecting safe reading for Catholics, moved there to, as the letters and documents now brought to light show, by Pope Paul V, solemnly rendered a decree that the doctrine of the double motion of, of the earth about its axis and about the sun is false and entirely contrary to Holy Scripture, and that this opinion must neither be taught nor advocated. The same decree condemned all writings of Copernicus and, quote, all writings which affirm the motion of the earth, which of course would include Galileo's writings and Kepler's writings. 
The condemnations were dis inscribed upon the index, and finally the papacy committed itself as an infallible judge and teacher to the world by prefixing to the index the usual papal bull, giving its monitions the most solemn papal sanction. To teach or even read the words denounced or passages condemned was to risk persecution in this world and damnation in the next. Science had apparently lost the decisive battle. In 1631, Father Melchior Inchofer of the Jesuits brought his artillery to bear upon Galileo with this de declaration. The opinion of the Earth's motion is of all heresies the most abominable, the most pernicious, the most scandalous, the immovability of the earth is thrice sacred, arguments against the immortality of the soul, the existence of God, and the incarnation should be tolerated sooner than an argument to prove that the earth moves. A little on the strong side. Um, many have wondered at this abjuration uh, when Galileo recanted and on account of it, have denied to Galileo the title of martyr. Uh, but let such gainsayers consider the circumstances. Here was an old man, and I don't know what that bracket is. Um, it just didn't carry across. One who had reached the allotted three score years and ten, broken with disappointments, worn out with labors and cares, dragged from Florence to Rome with the threat from the Pope himself that if he delayed, he should be brought in chains, sick in body and mind, given over to his oppressors by the Grand Duke who ought to have protected him, and on his arrival in Rome, threatened with torture. Continuing the same paragraph, what the Inquisition was, he knew well. He could remember as of but yesterday the burning of Giordano Bruno in that same city for scientific and philosophic heresy. He could remember, too, that only eight years before this very time, the Dominus, Archbishop of Spalatro, having been seized by the Inquisition for scientific and other heresies, had died in a dungeon and that his body and his writings had been publicly burned. To make all complete, there was prefixed to the index, this moving down to the, the index itself, there was prefixed to the index of the church forbidding all writings which affirm the motion of the earth a bull signed by the reigning pope, which by virtue of his infallibility as a divinely guarded teacher in matters of faith and morals, clinched this condemnation into the consciences of the whole Christian world. For the mass of books which appeared under the auspices of the church immediately after the condemnation of Galileo for the purpose of rooting out every vestige of the hated Copernican theory from the mind of the world, two may be taken as typical. The first of these was a work by Scipio Chiramonti uh, dedicated to Cardinal Barberini. Among his arguments against the double motion of the earth may be cited the following. Animals which move have limbs and muscles. The earth has no limbs or muscles, therefore it does not move. It is angels who make Saturn, Jupiter, the sun, etc. turn round. If the earth revolves, it must also have an angel in the center to set it in motion. But only devils live there. It would therefore be a devil who would impart motion to the earth. The planets, the suns, and fixed stars all belong to one species, namely that of the stars. It seems therefore to be grievous wrong to place the earth, which is a sink of impurity, among these heavenly bodies, which are pure and divine things. And by the way, that quote is an interesting evidence that the ancients did not see uh, the world as exalted, and therefore when Copernicus put us uh, into as one of the planets, he was actually promoting us rather than demoting us. The next, which I have selected from the mass of similar works, is the Anti Copernicus Catholicus of Palaccio, or Palaccio. It was intended to deal a finishing stroke at Galileo's heresy. In this, it is declared the scriptures always represent the earth as a, at rest and the sun and moon as in motion or if these latter bodies are ever represented as at rest, scripture represents this as a result of a great miracle. Um, there's actually two paragraphs there, and the, the split is right here, and I missed that on the way through. 
Uh, these writings must be prohibited because they teach certain principles about the position and motion of the terrestrial globe repugnant to Holy Scriptures and to the Catholic interpretation of it, not as hypotheses, but as established facts. Having shown that the authority of scriptures, of popes and of cardinals, is against the new astronomy, he gives a refutation based on physics. He asks, if we concede the motion of the earth, why is it that an arrow shot into the air falls back to the same spot, while the earth and all things on it have in the meantime moved very rapidly towards the east? Who does not see that, this great, confusion, that great confusion would result from this motion? But ere long, it was seen that this triumph of the church was in reality a prodigious defeat. From all sides came proofs that Copernicus and Galileo were right. And although Pope Urban and the Inquisition held Galileo in strict seclusion, forbidding him even to speak regarding the double motion of the earth, and although this condemnation of all books which affirm the motion of the earth was kept on the index, and although the papal bull still bound the index and the condemnations in it on the consciences of the faithful, and although colleges and universities under church control were compelled to teach the old doctrine, it was seen by clear-sighted men everywhere that the, this victory of the church was a disaster to the victors. The edition of the index published in 1819 was as inexorable towards the work of Copernicus and Galileo as its predecessors had been. But in the year 1820 came a crisis. Canon Settele, I guess, a uh, professor of astronomy at Rome had written an elementary book in which the Copernican system was taken for granted. The master of the sacred palace, Anne Fossey, as censor of the press, refused to allow the book to be printed unless Settele um, revised his work and treated the Copernican theory as merely a hypothesis. On this, Settele appealed to Pope Pius VII, and the Pope referred the matter to the Congregation of the Holy Office. At last, on the 16th of August, 1820, it was decided that Settele might teach the Copernican system as established, and this decision was approved by the Pope. This aroused considerable discussion, but finally, on the 11th of September, 1822, the Cardinals of the Holy Inquisition graciously agreed that the, quote, the printing and publication of works treating the, of the motion of the earth and the stability of the sun, in accordance with the general opinion of modern astronomers, is permitted at Rome, end quote. This decree was ratified by Pius VII, but it was not until 13 years later, in 1835, that there was, was issued an edition of the index from which the condemnation of works defending the double motion of the earth was left out. This was not a moment too soon, for as if the previous proofs had not been sufficient, each of the motions of the earth was now absolutely demonstrated anew, so as to be recognized by the ordinary observer. The parallelics of fixed stars, shown by Bessel as well as other noted astronomers in 1838, clinched forever the doctrine of the revolution of the Earth around the Sun. And in 1851, the great experiment of Foucault with the pendulum showed to the human eye the Earth in motion around its own axis. To make the matter complete, this experiment was publicly made in one of the churches in Rome by the eminent astronomer Father Secchi of the Jesuits in 1852, just 220 years after the Jesuits had done so much to secure Galileo's condemnation. And now for the retreat of the church after its victory over Galileo. Any history of the victory of astro astronomical science over dogmatic theology would be incomplete without some account of the retreat made by the church from all its former positions in the Galileo case. The retreat of the Protestant theologians was not difficult. A little skillful warping of scripture, um, a little skillful use of that time-honored phrase attributed to Cardinal Baronius that the Bible is meant to teach us not how the heavens go, but how men go to heaven, and a free use of explosive rhetoric against the pursuing army of scientists sufficed. Um, you can tell this guy's definitely on one side. But in the older church, it was far less easy. The retreat of the sacro-scientific army of church apologists lasted through two centuries. 
In spite of all that has been said by these apologists, there no longer remains the shadow of a doubt that the papal infallibility was committed fully and irrevocably against the double revolution of the earth. As the documents of Galileo's trial now published show, Paul V in 1616 published, pushed on with all his might the condemnation of Galileo and of the works of Copernicus and all the others teaching the motions of the earth around its own axis and around the sun. So too in the condemnation of Galileo in 1633 and in all the proceedings which led up to it and which followed it, Urban VIII was its, the central figure. Without his sanction, no action could have been taken. True, the Pope did not formally sign the decree against the Copernican theory then, but this came later. In 1664, Alexander VII prefixed to the index containing the condemnations of the works of Copernicus and Galileo and, quote, all books which affirm the motion of the earth, end quote, a papal bull signed by himself binding the contents of the index upon the consciences of the faithful. This bull confirmed and approved in express terms, finally, decisively, and infallibly, the condemnation of, quote, all books teaching the movement of the earth and the stability of the sun, end quote. The position of the Mother Church had been, had, thus, had been thus made especially difficult. And the first important move in retreat by the apologists was the statement that Galileo was condemned not because he affirmed the motion of the earth, but because he supported it from scripture. There was a slight appearance of truth in this. Undoubtedly, Galileo's letters to Castelli and the Grand Ducas, in which he attempted to show that his astronomical doctrines were not opposed to scripture, gave a new stir to religious bigotry. For a considerable time then, this quibble served its purpose. And I'm skipping the rest of that paragraph in the interest of uh, time. Having been dislodged from this point, the church apologists sought cover among, under the statement that Galileo was condemned not for heresy, but for contumacy and want of respect for the Pope. But it would seem to be a very poor service rendered to the doctrine of papal infallibility to claim that a dis decision so immense in its consequences should be influenced, could be influenced by the personal resentment of the reigning pontiff. The next rally was made about the statement that the persecution of Galileo was the result of a quarrel between Aristotelian professors on one side and professors favoring the experimental method on the other. But this position was attacked and carried by a very simple statement. If the divine guidance of the church is such that it can be dragged into a professorial squabble, and made the tool of a faction bringing in about a most disastrous condemnation of approved truth, how did the church at that time differ from any human organization sunk into decrepitude, managed nominally by simpletons, but really by schemers? The next point at which a stand was made was the assertion that the condemnation of Galileo was provisory, but this proved a more treacherous shelter than the other. The wording of the decree of condemnation itself is sufficient answer to this claim. When doctrines have been solemnly declared as those of Galileo were solemnly declared under sanction of the highest authority in the church, quote, contrary to the sacred scriptures, end quote, quote, opposed to, reason, to the true faith, end quote, and quote, false and absurd in theology and philosophy, end quote. To say that such declarations are provisory is to say that the truth held by the church is not immutable. Still another contention was made, in some respects more curious than any other. It was mainly that Galileo was no more a victim of the Catholics than of Protestants, for they more than the, the Catholic theologians impelled the Pope to, take, to the action taken. While the retreat from, this, from position to position was going on, there was a constant discharge of small arms in the shape of innuendos, hints, and sophistries. Every attempt was, every effort was made to blacken Galileo's private character. The irregularities of his early life were dragged forth. You may remember he had three illegitimate children. And stress was even laid upon breaches of etiquette. But this succeeded so poorly that even as far back as 1850, it was thought necessary to cover the retreat by some more careful strategy. This new strategy is instructive. The original documents of the Galileo trial had been brought during the Napoleonic conquest to Paris. But in 1846, they were returned to Rome by the French government on the express pledge by the papal authorities that they should be published. In 1850, after many delays and various pretexts, the long expected publication appeared. The personage charged with presenting them to the world was Monsignor Marini, 
This is another place where I split one of the paragraphs. This long paragraph. This ecclesiastic was of a kind which has too often afflicted both the church and the world at large. Despite the solemn promise of the papal court, the wily Marini became the instrument of the Roman authorities in evading the promise. By suppressing a document here and interpolating a statement there, he managed to give plausible standing ground for nearly every important sophistry ever broached to save the infallibility of the church and destroy the reputation of Galileo. He it was who supported the idea that Galileo was, quote, condemned not for heresy, but for contumacy. But sometime later came an investigator very different from Monsignor Marini. This was a Frenchman, M. Le Penoy. Pardon my French. Like Marini, Le Penoy was uh, devoted to the church, but unlike Marini, he could not lie. Having obtained access in 1867 to the Galileo documents at the Vatican, he published several of the most important without suppression or pious fraudulent manipulation. This made all the entrenchments based on Marini's statements untenable. Another retreat had to be made. And now came the most desperate effort of all, the apologetic army reviving an idea which the popes and the church had spurned for centuries declared that the popes as popes had never condemned the doctrines of Copernicus and Galileo, that they had condemned them as men simply, and that therefore the church had never been committed to them, and the condemnation was made by the cardinals of the Inquisition and the Index, and that the Pope had evidently been restrained by interposition of providence from signing the, their condemnation. Nothing could show the desperation of the retreating party better than jugglery like this. Fact is that in the official account of the condemnation by Bellarmine, I think that's Bellarmini, in 1616, he declares distinctly that he makes this condemnation, quote, in the name of His Holiness the Pope, end quote. Again, from Pope Urban downward, among the church authorities of the 17th century, the decision was always acknowledged to be made by the Pope and the church. Urban VIII spoke of that of 1616 as made by Pope Paul V and the Church, and of that of 1633 as made by himself and the Church. Pope Alexander VII in 1664 in his bull Speculatoris solemnly sanctioned the condemnation of all books affirming the Earth's movement. This contention then was at last utterly given up by the honest Catholics themselves. In 1870, a Roman Catholic clergyman in England, the Reverend Mr. Roberts, evidently thinking that the time had come to tell the truth, published a book entitled The Pontifical Degrees Against the Earth's Movement, and in this exhibited the incontrovertible evidences that the papacy had committed itself and its infallibilities uh, fully against the movement of the earth. This Catholic clergyman showed from the original record that Pope Paul V in 1616 had presided over the tribunal condemning the doctrine of the earth's movement and ordering Galileo to give up the opinion. He showed that Pope Urban VIII in 1633 pressed on, directed and promulgated the final condemnation, making himself in all these ways responsible for it. And finally, he showed that Pope Alexander VII in 1664 by his bull Speculatoris Domus Israel attached to the index, condemning all books which affirm the motion of the earth, had absolutely pledged the papal infallibility against the earth's movement. He also confessed that under the rules laid down by the highest authorities in the church, and especially by Sixtus V and Pius IX, there was no escape from this conclusion. In recalling it at this day, there stand out from its later phases Two efforts at compromise especially instructive as showing the embarrassment of militant theology in the 19th century. The first of these was made by John Henry Newman in the days when he was hovering between the Anglican and Roman churches. In one of his sermons before the University of Oxford, he spoke as follows. Scripture says that the sun moves and that the earth is stationary and science that the earth moves and the sun is comparatively at rest. How can we determine which of these opposite statements is the very truth till we know what motion is? If our idea of motion is but an accidental result of our present senses, neither proposition is true and both are true. Neither true ph philosophically, both true for certain practical purposes in the system in which they are respectively found. 
The other utterance was uh, suggested by de Bonald and uh, developed in the Dublin Review as is understood by one of Newman's associates. This argument was nothing less than an attempt to retreat under the charge of deception against the Almighty himself. It is as follows. But it may well be doubted whether the church did retard the progress of scientific truth. What retarded it was the circumstance that God had through had thought fit to express many texts of scriptures in words which have every appearance of denying the earth's motion. But it is God who did this, not the church. And moreover, since he saw fit so to act as to retard the progress of scientific truth, it would be little to her discredit, even if it were true, that she had followed his example. This argument, like Mr. Goss's famous attempt to reconcile geology to Genesis by supposing that for some inscrutable purposes God deliberately deceived the thinking world into giving the earth all the appearances of development through long periods of time while really creating it in six days, each of an evening and morning, seems only to have awakened the amazed pity of thinking men. This, like the argument of Newman, was the last desperate effect, attempt, effort of Anglican and Roman divines to save something from the wreckage of dogmatic theology. Most unjustly, then, would Protestantism ta uh, taunt Catholicism for excluding knowledge of astronomical truths from European Catholic universities in the 17th and 18th centuries, while real knowledge of geological and biological and anthropological truth is denied or pitifully diluted in so many American Protestant colleges in universities in the 19th century. Now, of course, he's writing in the 19th century, and so he's using this entire experience and turning it in on people who want to argue against uh, the idea of evolution. Um, thus far are the words of Andrew Dixon White. My own take is this. This argument of Andrew Dixon White is one of the most common arguments for the belief in science over scriptural authority, and I do say that it has some power to it. I think it needs to be dealt with, and eventually we're going to try to deal with that. What, what do you do with scripture? How can we interpret scripture in such a way that we won't get uh, um, uh, uh, we won't have to deal with this kind of a uh, uh, slow retreat? Um, but I think also that it is a powerful argument against papal infallibility. Um, it may be kind of um, a, um, if it stands up, I think it is a death blow argument. Uh, its existence probably explains why the Catholic hierarchy has eschewed any challenge to science whatsoever. Because if they ever do, this subject will come up and they don't want it to come up. Andrew Dixon White was virulently anti-ecclesiastic, and I will have to say that he was at least care occasionally careless. Uh, reading through his book, he cites three sources for uh, the idea that um, the days of uh, Genesis 1 are not literal. Um, Origin, which everybody knows, uh, at least all the scholars that I know know. The, um, Augustine, which everybody knows, and Athanasius, which I had never heard of. So I went and looked up and uh, could not find it where his reference was. Couldn't find anything close to it. And in fact, I went and searched the entire book that he cites. Uh, one of the nice things about the internet is that you can do that and you, uh, there's only one place where it mentions six days at all. And uh, uh, that place has nothing to do with creation. So I don't know where he came up with that. It's certainly, at the bare minimum, he, uh, uh, he didn't write down the right, right reference. It's possible that it may be a literature bluff. The Catholic Church, unfortunately, has its own vested interest in this area, of course. And so... I don't think that uh, you can question uh, authority. Uh, to me, the authority resides in the history itself. And Andrew Dixon White simply provides a, a summary of that history. 
And the questions I'll leave with you is who's right and what difference does it make? And is the doctrine of papal infallibility dead? And uh, with that, I will invite uh, comments and questions. Um, I noticed that at least there was no argument here about Earth's flatness that's being forwarded, or re supposed flatness, or some such thing. That's true. So the they, flat, the flat the, Earth. Ev apparently, everybody understood the Earth to be round. Then um, the flat Earth has gained a reputation. Uh, since the time of Andrew Dixon White. Andrew Dixon White had little hints here and there, and sometime we should probably go over the, the history of the flat earth uh, in, uh, uh, in apologetic literature. Uh, but uh, Andrew Dixon White recognized that it was, an, uh, at the very least, that it was not a... Uh, uh, not a slam dunk. But didn't he promote that idea? Uh, didn't he promote the idea of flat earth uh, thinking? Well, he did, but he did in such a way that you can't nail him on it. It was more of an innuendo than a specific... Uh, uh, that would be a study in and of itself as to exactly how, where Andrew Dixon White came down on the idea of the flat earth. Um, what he would say is there were exceptions, but the majority said. And, uh, uh, of course, if you go with the majority of astronomers, there's no question. <laughs> majority of who? Majority of, uh, majority of theologians is really no question either. The round earth wins. Um, Go ahead. Oh, you, yeah, you have something to say? Um, you know, looking at your presentation here, it, it comes across as there was a big battle of truth back then. But, you know, which there was. But um, it seems like when I took West, History of Western Civ and a lot of the faculty boiled it down to it was just simply a battle for power. That truth was just kind of thrown out the window for this because people in the church, there was a lot of people in the church that were there for its ability to put power on them over people's lives. Um, they felt as if the new science that was coming out was was going to put that in jeopardy. And that, um, anyway, that, that this was actually the battle that was happening at that time. That um, uh, people who really would have, should have been leaders in the church um, that had really, that would really give themselves to God would not be the type that would battled in this way. Do you, do you yeah. look at it as a battle of, for truth back then, or do you look at it as a false battle in, in fact that people were just holding on to their, their power? I think the attitude that people were simply holding on to their power, uh, and that was uh, it pure and simple and naked, uh, really won't hold water. Uh, I'm not saying that there weren't some people who were totally Machiavellian. Uh, and I'm not saying that some of those people didn't uh, f go for short-term gain at the expense of realizing that long-term this was a disaster. Um, 
But I think that there were a lot of people who truly wrestled with the question, what do you do with Joshua's long day when he commands the sun to stand still and doesn't say, earth, stop moving? And then just for good measure, he doesn't say, moon, stand still over there. Uh, you read that, and the first natural interpretation is the sun stopped and the moon sti stood still. And in fact, the text goes on to say that very thing. So what they, they were taking what was a very natural way of understanding scripture. One can argue at this point that it's perhaps not the best way. Um, but I think people had not wrestled with the question of scriptural authority in this area well enough. If they had, I think they would have come to the conclusions that Galileo did. Um, the mistake that is made when people make that kind of claim is, I think, partly that nobody can be sincerely in error. And I think that's just wrong. Nobody can be sincerely in error? Well, yes. I mean, the, the church people were all after power, right? Well, I wouldn't say all of them, but a, a lot of them were. Well, I, you know, there, there's going to be a proportion that, are, that, you know, really don't care about the truth. But there's going to be a significant proportion of them that really do and are looking at appearances and making the wrong judgment. But don't you think that happens now with, in academia where people have gained power because of their accomplishments and then all of a sudden something comes along to tell them that um, what you just propose is being proved false and they hold on to it because they don't want to lose their position? Of course it happens that way. Um, <coughs> And uh, you know, a couple of illustrations that I can give is uh, the idea that the Earth is the center of the universe and is you know really important because it's at the center. You know, by that rationale, uh, from the ancients, hell must have been the most important part in the universe, whereas <laughs> it obviously wasn't. You know, uh, that. That entire philosophy is wrong, but it has been used again and again. And I remember being up in Glacier View at 2003, where right after this point had been made, somebody got up and said, Copernicus demoted the Earth from its central position of importance. As if the entire discussion had gone right over his head. Uh, so I know that people can hang on to this. Well, there's another aspect of all this that kind of has been bothering me, like the presentation last week. Um, aren't we kind of arguing about devices of communications and then, and then coming back later and saying that their, their devices were perfect, therefore you know exactly what they were thinking? Um, just like when you say, have the sun stop, you know, if they didn't understand that the sun was moving, but in fact, no, that they understood that the sun was stationary and the earth stationary. actually moved and make yeah. it appear that the sun moved. Right. If they didn't understand that, what other communication could they make to make everybody understand what they were saying? And then when they use that type of communication, it gets locked down because somebody writes it down. And then when they find out that the, work, the, the universe works in a different way after all, well then they um, all of a sudden what's the word, um, say that they're completely wrong or this is exactly how they were, uh, I don't know how to get to that. Well, that if, you, if you're saying that the, that the ancients had a really well-developed theory of how things worked, 
and they wrote it out in textbooks just like Ptolemy would. You know, I think that's probably erroneous. Well, and, and that's one of the reasons why when, when uh, the, there was some implied criticism of the translation of the Rakia as something, and I think that may actually be the most, most accurate translation because I don't, I think they, you know, it was just this thing out there and they didn't really know exactly how it was structured. Yeah, but if they were to explain things happening uh, in a truer fashion that we would understand, would they be able to explain it to them? Because they don't, they don't know the concept behind it. So you have to use words that uh, matches the theory at the time so that, um, that they can get the communication going. See, I'm just, I'm just saying that... No, that you're raising not some very only, important points. I'm just saying that there, there's two problems here. One is their theories, and the other is the devi devices they use for communication, that both of them have to be looked at to, to really understand what they were thinking back then, or if if what they were thinking was, was actually true to them. I, yeah. I don't know. Well, this gets back to the issue of what authority does Scripture have? Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, that the questions you're raising are very important ones, and I hope that as we continue to explore Galileo, that we will deal with some of these questions, because I think, I think they are <coughs> central. If we're to avoid making the same kind of mistakes that were made in the Galileo affair, and I think they were clearly made, then I think we have to deal with these exact kind of questions. Uh, Ariel? Oh. Uh, well, it's, it's not 11.30 yet, but um, I guess some have to leave. Yeah. Yeah, he's got one. Ariel? Well, uh, this uh, Galilee story, as we know, is, uh, is an icon, and it is uh, repeatedly mentioned any time the uh, issue of church and science come up. It, it is uh, the one story that has spread all over the scientific community, and, and, and it's it's mentioned over and over and over again. Well, maybe you can understand mm. why, looking at the data. Uh, it's a good example. What I want to point out is that uh, why is the scientific community so fixed on this point? When you look at the history of science and you find, hey, uh, there's a whole bunch of other examples we ought to also recognize which are not mentioned very often. Uh, for instance, uh, the idea of catastrophism. Uh, you know, uh, up till uh, the 1800s, at least, uh, everyone more or less believed in a major catastrophe or major catastrophes uh, as being the important shapers of uh, the geology of the earth and then came in the uniformitarianism for 150 years no catastrophes and then the scientific community reverses itself a second time and starts accepting catastrophes as a part of, of history uh, this is not just uh, an issue of science science being in error once it's twice uh, and you come to the issue of uh, the origin of spontaneous origin. Uh, scientific community very much believed in spontaneous origin and came Pasteur and settled it out and then came evolution and put it back in. Reversal. And interestingly enough, they still don't know how. Uh, uh, after Harvard's had now, what, seven years on their five-year contract? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, so this is, again, a double reversal. or. Uh, sometimes take play tectonics, you know, major reversal and so on. Uh, uh, and interestingly enough, first <coughs> proposed by a, a catastrophist creationist. Yes. <laughs> uh, and so uh, uh, 
a little balance here would, would seem to be helpful. Well, see, the, the uh, whole point of this is not to have that balance. The reason this gets the press it does is because it proves that the ch Catholic Church in particular and Christendom in general can be wrong about scientific stuff and that science can win. And the message of Andrew Dixon White is to say that science is winning here, science is winning there, science is winning here, science won big with Galileo. So that's why Galileo's in the center because nobody will argue that anymore. It's kind of like finishing <laughs> off an argument and bringing in the Nazis. And you know, nobody argues Nazism anymore. So uh, th that's why Godwin's Law is so inevitable is because it's a place where you can go and you can absolutely destroy the opponent. I mean, if anybody says, for example, if you're in an argument and you want to say, is there such a thing as evil? Well, and somebody says no. Well, your final argument can be, well, were the Nazis evil? <laughs> and you got them. See, and, and this, is, this is what they wanted to do is they wanted to destroy the infallibility of the Pope and in the process, destroy the infallibility of scripture, and that leaves them as the single authority. And, and so from their perspective, it is really a, a, a uh, argument that is going to give them the kind of power they want. So, uh, and it's even nicer if you think you're right and you have power, see, and then you, you get both power and authority. But in, in, in all of this argumentation uh, is the uh, added uh, problem of the vagaries of language. To this day, we still speak of sunrise and sunset, even though we clearly know that it's the earth that's doing the moving. I mean, even Andrew Dixon White will use sunrise and sunset and then go on to talk about sun not moving and the earth doing the moving. And and I would think uh, maybe 100 or 200 years from now when somebody reads some of that, they'll be thoroughly confused. What is he talking about? One word he's saying, earth moves. The next word he's saying, sun moves. What exactly is he arguing for? Actually, they won't be thoroughly confused because they'll still be using the same language. Strangely. How, well, unless, of course, they invent something new. However, I mean, just think about this. And why do we have this kind of argument leveled against the Bible? Is because there is this concerted effort to essentially invalidate whatever the Bible is saying. And now, how do you do that? By interpreting something that is said in such a way that it appears absurd. Now, how can you do that? Precisely in this way. Now, let me give you an instance of how we could do with something that can happen right here. If, for example, the policeman said, stop right there or I'll shoot, what is he meaning? Does he mean I command the earth to stop rotating? Or does he mean that person who's running should stop relative to the policeman? And that brings us into the most important little issue of motion, that all motion is relative, relative to something else. And by uh, the way, if, if the guy's on a train yes, that's moving on the earth, he'll that's still right. yell, stop right there or I'll shoot. That's right. He doesn't mean to command the train to stop. Or, or you know, it, he means that the guy who's running on the train ought to stop. And when the guy stopped, it, uh, he doesn't mean that all the molecules that comprise his body have to stop. That would be absolute zero in temperature. Or he doesn't mean to say you're sto to stop breathing. I mean, then he would have the final motion of collapsing to the ground. <laughs> you know, I mean, clearly, we have to think in terms of what is meant by the language we use, the words we use, and what was the original intent? And whenever we seek to kind of ridicule some thinking and we twist the intended meaning in such a way as to 
rendered it totally absurd. Certainly you can make the Bible look absurd. But is that what was really meant by those who wrote it and by God who inspired it? That's the real question that we need to go into. You have a comment back there. I think whenever we look at the struggles that have happened in the past and the struggles that have happened today, one of the things that is often overlooked is the struggle for power. Often it's less about truth and, and almost totally about power and position. And I think even back in Galileo's time when we talk about the popes, I don't see a lot of people sitting down and studying the Bible to see what the Bible says. I, but I see a lot of stuff and argument between human beings that says, I'm the pope, therefore, or I'm the scientist, therefore. It was a struggle for power, and a great deal of pride was involved. And today, evolutionists are struggling for power. Well, I, I, I think that... Um, I think that all of these are, are correct observations, and I think that one of the things we have to be very, very careful of, of is that we don't settle our own arguments by appeals to power. And I think that one of the worst things that we can do is to get control of uh, the board of some university and say, okay, all you guys are out because we own the place. You know, when we start doing that, we'll, we will put ourselves in a position to where uh, those kinds of criticisms can properly be leveled at us. And uh, that's, you know, I get very nervous about that kind of thing. I think that we need to be much more concentrated on what is the truth and bringing out what is the truth. And that's one of the arguments I have for doing things like we did last week, where we have people actually sitting down and you can listen to both sides. But at the same time, we want to be careful that we don't cede the argument and cede the power to somebody else just because we want to be so nice. I agree wholeheartedly. You notice that I didn't give up the entire Sabbath school to somebody else. I, 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 think, that, I think that you have to have, if truth is to be served, then, then people who believe in truth can't be squashed mm -hmm. any more than, than uh, then people who believe in error should be squashed. And I think that when we have a department that will teach you one side of the controversy and not teach you the other, a very good argument can be made for this is a power grab rather than an actual teaching moment. And I think that that has happened in some places. Yes. I think uh, it's easy. Each of us can be easily intoxicated by power. Uh, it's, it's a human tendency that we need to always guard against. Truth should be more powerful than error, eventually. Uh, in the meantime, we should be very careful that we don't uh, abuse truth uh, and persecute. Uh, those who see things differently. Uh, it's a question of basic motive. Are you trying to help? Or are you trying to prove uh, or defend your power? Uh, very important uh, question we need to ask ourselves all the time. And it's an important point, too. Um, the way of Jesus was not to defend his power. As those of us who were in the first service heard, uh, this is somebody who is willing to go down to show people and to gain, to gain authority because of who he was and uh, because of how he fit with the rest of the universe. Uh, now that's that takes some explaining, but um, it isn't just the name. It's what you stand for. Um, there were two Jesus. <coughs> one Jesus, the Son of the Father, and one Jesus, the Messiah, who were on trial. And one of them got picked by the populace. 
and it was not the, the name that made the difference. They were both named after the successor of Moses, Joshua. It was the, it was what one had to say about where truth and the, and the uh, struggle for righteousness came from and where the other one set it centered in. One, se one centered it in, one surrender to God, and one centered it in one's resistance to the Romans. Uh, I think that's a lesson for all of us. And don't get me wrong, the Romans were bad people in uh, a certain very important ways. But one of them said, my kingdom is not of this world. Otherwise, my servants would fight. The other one was the leader of a revolutionary group. You know, which do you really want? Do you want power or do you want authority? And by authority, I don't mean authoritarian. I mean authoritative. There's a big difference. Respect. Yeah. Well, I see that our time has uh, come in and gone. And um, so hopefully next week we'll discuss a little more about the implications of Galileo for actually interpreting the Bible.